quite a different experience to Australia. Absolutely. <laughs> and I had the, I had a few trucks here when I was doing distribution before I started my printing business uh, in Victoria. Uh, I had up to 14 tonners. So we used to distribute recycled pizza boxes throughout Victoria. So, oh. yep. So I've been everywhere in Victoria. <laughs> Nay. <laughs> Oh, it's it's not often that we have somebody who who's actually so familiar with the industry in a position like yours. So that's great for us, that's for sure. And Lindsay Fox and me, we were at a police training in 2010. You know, we had great experience with him. Everyone got oh. up and said, I'm so and so, I'm so and so. He got up at the end. There were eight of us, along with the commissioner of police at the time and the premier. He got up and said, I'm Lindsay Fox, truck driver. Thank you. Sit down. So. Oh. <laughs> awesome. He's always, he's always not let his position, you know, cloud his thinking. Totally agree with him. Nothing yeah. wrong with that. Yeah. He's wonderful. Absolutely. Good. So let's let's see how we go today. I think yesterday, the Keras Mental Health, that we uh, streamlined it on Facebook. We had 500 plus people. So. Wow, brilliant. That's awesome. You ready, Nitya? Yep, ready. Okay, <laughs> uh, let's begin. Good morning, and my name is Vasan Srinivasan. I'm the chairperson at Mental Health Foundation Australia. It's a privilege to lead this 91 years old, first ever community-based mental health organization established in Australia, Victoria. In spirit of reconciliation, the Mental Health Foundation Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples here with us this morning. On behalf of the Mental Health Foundation Australia, I would like to welcome and thank each and every one of you for attending our Truck Drivers Mental Health Forum today organized as a part of National Mental Health Awareness Campaign 2021. I myself have experience of driving heavy vehicles when I first arrived in this country. So I can personally watch for the physical and mental tolls of this work and the importance of talking about this. The National Mental Health Month is an initiative of the Mental Health Foundation Australia to advocate for all and raise awareness of Australian mental health as a community. The MHFA, National Mental Health is unlike many other mental health awareness campaigns. It aims to bring all Australians together in a nationwide conversation about the mental health, and we aim to maintain this conversation for an entire month and beyond. Though a series of various uh, mental health related events, National Mental Health Month is a program that the mental health is extremely proud of, Mental Health Foundation is extremely proud of and we intended to reach out to and educate as many Australians as possible to help reduce stigma and facilitate positive and not judgmental discussion surrounding the important topic of mental health in Australia. With one in five Australians experiencing a mental health illness, it is a time we give a mental health its due attention. And that is exactly what the Mental Health Foundation is want to achieve. Throughout this month, Many events have been organized in each and every state and territory of Australia, aiming to attract and unite Australians of all ages and backgrounds to raise awareness of the need of better mental health for all. This year, the theme of National Mental Health Month is post-pandemic recovery and challenges and resilience. This year's theme will focus on raising awareness about mental health in various industries and communities Every individual has faced, and many are still facing unprecedented challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic. With this theme in mind, we aim to extend our campaign even wider than previous years. With events planned to embrace many different community groups and people of all ages of walking on the road to recovery and fostering resilience, resilience and recovery. Please join us celebrating the Mental Health Foundation Australia by viewing a short video. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Vasan Srinivasan, Chairperson of the Mental Health Foundation Australia. It's a privilege to lead this wonderful community-based mental health organization 
in its 91st year of establishment. The MHFA has grown strength to strength over the past few years. With Victorian Mental Health Month in 2018, the National Mental Health Month occurring in 2019, 2020 and this year in 2021. Last year, COVID-19 did not stop us from achieving our National Mental Health Month campaign. I'm proud to say we successfully shifted many events to a virtual platform, very much being able to pursue our objectives of raising awareness and advocating for better Australian mental health. Our primary aim is to reach out to and educate as many Australians as possible, to help reduce stigma and to encourage constructive and non-judgmental dialogue on Australia's critical mental health issue. The highlight of last year's campaign was reaching out to 100,000 Australians all across the country for our national walks for mental health, both virtually through our MHFA app and physically in some states. What a grand success that was. In 2021, with pandemic still affecting many of us, we decided not to give up once again, curating a carefully chosen blend of virtual and physical events for Australians to participate in. This year, we have a new and improved MHFA app, giving people the opportunity to participate in National Mental Health Month from the palms of their hands. This year, theme is mental health and post-pandemic recovery challenges and resilience. Mental Health Foundation Australia is proud to partner with Australian technology business, DB Results, and take up the wellbeing app, Am I OK? to support our members, enabling individuals to regularly check in on a private and secure platform and ask the question, am I okay? Am I okay also alerts the user when it's time to seek outside help. We thank DB Results for this opportunity to promote well-being and early intervention. This year, we have launched a special initiative, the Mental Health Appeal on the 10th of October, our World Mental Health Day. Through this, we aim to raise funds for the development of a course promoting life and safety in young people. At the MHFA, we pride ourselves in making sure all of our programs are for the community and powered by the community. We have a vast growing network of multicultural ambassadors, youth ambassadors and future leaders who further the community voice in promoting mental health and well-being. Our multicultural network has inspired our educational and multicultural webinars as an initiative to assist individuals cope with success during the pandemic. I would like to take this moment to thank our board directors and patrons, scientific advisory committee members, our wonderful staff, multicultural and youth ambassadors, future leaders, MHFA members and major sponsors for their continuous support to our organization. As we continue to work to deepen understanding of the importance of mental well-being and educating the community. Let's work in solidarity for the benefit of our mental health. Thank you, Australia. Thank you. Uh, now, I would like to invite and welcome our address speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Pritchard, Monash University. Dr. Elizabeth Pritchard is a research fellow with the driving health safety within the insurance work and health group. She's a leading qualitative study exploring the factors influencing truck driver health from the perspective of drivers and their family within the School of Public Health and, and Preventative, Preventive Medicine, Monash University. She registered occupational therapy specializing um, in neuro rehabilitation and completed her PhD in health sciences through the Monash University in 2014, exploring participation and return to daily activities following hospitalization with our older adults. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Pritchard. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Vasan, for that introduction. It's wonderful. So, good morning, Kia ora, Womanjika. I acknowledge the sacred land too of the, where we are based, and I give my respect to the thousands of years of wisdom and knowledge found with the people who are the indigenous owners of the land. I am also bringing greetings from Aotearoa, New Zealand, my homeland. So thank you for the opportunity to be part of today's forum as we explore opportunities 
to improve the health and well-being of track drivers across Australia. We all know the perils of track driving. We've either experienced them, as you, you have said this, Fasan and Lindell, <laughs> or we know people who know people who have experienced them. And the, the perils of track driving in relation to the long work hours, the isolation, the sedentary nature, the vibration in the tracks, the challenges around accessing healthy foods on the road, the facilities on the road or the lack of facilities on the road, the demands of on-time deliveries where there are so many factors beyond the control of the driver. Yet within the industry, we must find a way to boost the health and well-being, both physically and mentally, of track drivers across the nation. So to this end, the driving health team at Monash University, of which I am part of, created a three-year research partnership study with research partners like Lynn Fox, the New South Wales Centre for Work Health and Safety, and the Transport Workers Union to focus on health and well-being of truck drivers. And the study was also supported by the National Health and Medical Research Council Partnership Project Scheme. So to our knowledge, it is the largest Australian-based study on truck driver health. While there is a large body of research that comes out from North America and Europe, we believe it is critical to have the evidence that represents Australian drivers working under Australian conditions. So some of the reasons why the study was created relates to the evidence following a study that was entitled in 2018, Work-Related Injury and Disease of Australian Truck Drivers, which found that truck drivers were reportedly more at risk of work-related injuries and disease than other motorists or other people in the industry with over 120,000 accepted compensation claims between 2004 and 2015. Now this claims and amounts to over 1 million lost weeks of work, which is huge for the industry. And the study also found that only 17% of those with this working time loss was the result of vehicle crashes. So the remaining 83% was due to other causes like slips, trips, falls, noise, physical and psychological stress. So that's 83% beyond crashes that we didn't really know much about in detail or the factors that contributed to these claims. So this is why the, the three-year study came about and we're in two and a half years, it finishes in Mar March next year, 2022. So this is why it came about to explore these factors in more detail. So one of the areas we focused on gaining more understanding about was psychological distress and mental health within the truck driving industry. So today I'm gonna to briefly touch on some of the findings of the study. I won't bore you to death with all sorts of charts and graphs, I'm just a couple. <laughs> and then I'm going to um, talk about and present some possible, possible solutions that came up from the study going forward. So I'm just going to share slides now. Right, all good on that end. Strengthening mental health with truck drivers. Have you got the slides on that end? Yes, wonderful, fantastic, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the Driving Health Study is a three-year partnership um, study and, and it culminates and it has examined multiple sources of data to inform our findings over the last two and a half years so far. So some of this comes from existing sources, for example, the 120,000 accepted claims that I mentioned, and some of it involves creating new data for the first time and using new da um, data for the first time from the 3,500 death benefit claims as well from the largest industry in transport. So the new data was generated from 1,400 drivers in the form of an online telephone survey. Sorry, online survey, and then the telephone survey came after that. And also in-depth surveys with both drivers and family members. So the result is that we now have the clearest picture to date of the health and well-being of Australian truck drivers. And one of the areas that we were asked to look at and one of the areas we, we explored more in the online survey in detail was around psychological distress. So psychological distress, 
is described as a state of emotional suffering that is associated with stresses and demands that are difficult to cope with on a daily life. And if we leave this unrecognized, psychological distress can lead to higher levels of stress and mental ill health. So we need to address this in the earlier stages of any interventions so that we have an emphasis on prevention and support. And also for those who experience high levels of dis, uh, psychological distress, we really need to make sure that, that those people have support and access to the services that they require. So there are many things that impact the quality of life and mental health of a driver every day, which I've already basically mentioned in my opening statement. The state of the roads, the quality of the truck, family life, the amount of sleep, health routines, the way drivers are treated by public, the way they're treated by the companies and the bosses within the organisations that they work. And all of these factors impact to some degree on the mental health of the driver. And whether they experience any psychological distress or not, or level of anxiety or depression, or progressing through to serious mental health issues. So because of the importance of maintaining and improving mental health for all workers in any workspace, but particularly for drivers with the added pressures of isolation on the road and the factors that I've mentioned, psychological distress was one of the specific areas we looked at in detail. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a snapshot of what some of those um, responses were and some of the findings are. So just over 50% or one in two drivers surveyed, this is um, just around 1,400 drivers, experienced some form of psychological distress. 36, nearly 37% had moderate distress and 13% severe distress. One in four drivers, about 19%, reported being diagnosed with a mental health condition. And this is comparable with the National Health Statistics for Australian Men. Younger drivers, those under age 35, experienced significant levels of psychological distress, significant in relation to um, research evidence um, data analysis. So with 22% of the severe distress range, we're, which is almost double that of the Australian male, which was at 12% for the similar age. So this is four times greater than that of the older drivers as well, those over 55. So long work hours, between 40 and 60 hours on the road contributes to psychological distress as well. It was also found that the drivers working less than 40 hours had half the odds of experiencing severe psychological distress compared to those working over 60 hours a week. Physical health conditions have an impact as well on psychological distress. And drivers who had specific diagnosed conditions such as back problems or arthritis, traumatic injury or migraines, all had significantly higher odds of experiencing severe psychological distress. Short haul drivers had significantly higher odds of experiencing severe psychological distress than long haul drivers. And that may be um, interesting to explore a little bit later in question time. The analysis of the life insurance claims of individuals within the transport industry shows that the suicide is a second leading cause of death in transport workers under the age of 39 years. And this is deeply concerning for all of the industry. Workers' compensation data also shows that truck drivers are much less likely to access mental health services than other workers, mm. and only do so after some time has elapsed since the original injury claim. So the latter fact is, again, very concerning. As as we need to think about the destigmatization of talking about mental health and asking for help and getting the right help into the industry, which is a male dominated industry, and have the certain responses to admitting to the need for help as well. So just one more little graph, and then I'll talk about some of the exp lived experience that we uh, got from some of the interviews from some of the drivers as well. <clears throat> So information from the telephone survey, so from the 1,400 people, we then telephone surveyed 332 people in a little bit more depth, and then I um, was privileged enough to interview 19 drivers and seven family members in, in much more depth as well. So information from the telephone survey explored more about the factors impacting psychological distress and found that over 50% 
had no psychological distress. 37, moderate and 12% severe. So again, this is concerning because if we leave this unaddressed and we don't get the services and the access to the health professionals that these people need, then it can progress and impact hugely on road safety, relationships, <coughs> physical health, and the ability for the industry to sustain a healthy workforce going forward. So the telephone survey results also identified six domains that strongly impacted the level of a distress with drivers. And these include things like the personal domain of age, family situation, pre-existing health conditions, financial stress, the type of payment that they received for their driving hours, the um, workplace environment, any workplace bullying or harassment, our occupational health and safety training, the diet, the fatigue levels, loneliness, and those types of health risks as well. So as we know, health is multifaceted. There is no one cause for a problem or a solution. And in completing the in-depth interviews, we got an even deeper understanding of the interaction between these factors and some possible solutions coming through. So the drivers and family members talked about the lack of understanding people had around mental health in the industry, in many areas of the industry. Some of them explained how some of their bosses were, were hugely supportive and fantastic. Others explained how they mentioned that they were, they were struggling with things and then found themselves without shifts or without a job later. So there was a, there was a whole range of experiences that was, that was described. So this included drivers, the, the, the um, mental health um, concerns and discussions included drivers themselves experiencing anxiety or depression, but not being aware of this. And also many of the drivers did not feel that they could talk to anybody about this. They talked about the male macho um, bravado type culture within, within themselves and within the industry. Many were afraid they might lose their jobs if they admitted that they were feeling stressed or anxious. And drivers were very open about talking about their experiences as well with other people. One of the family members talked about somebody coming home with a short fuse. And I was like, I don't think they realise that's, that's due to stress and mental health issues. So both the family members and the drivers identified extensive factors that were beyond the control of the driver during the day and how this increased the stress. And it just kept on packing and packing the stress on and impacted the ability to do a job and maintain a healthy body and mindset. Many talked about the unrealistic demands, the bosses and how they were treated and how they're treated by the public. And also the ongoing demands and, and pressures of family and finances. So some of the some of the statements from the um, the interviews with drivers was one of these. There are too many people in offices making decisions for us. We're working on the road and they don't understand our job. So there was there was a sort of an overarching call for let's talk more with the drivers, let's listen to the drivers, and let's find out what it's really like. There's a whole lot of policies that have been put in place that some of them have been supportive and some of them have been really useful in, how, in who, they're, who they're being and how they do their work. However, there's many of them that they find just increase the stress of the day. And for a family member, one of the family members said, drivers didn't want to admit potentially that they have issues. And as I said, they may not even understand how mental health issues and problems manifest. So these are the things that we need to think about and the strain of the separation of people on the road. Some companies stated that they weren't, that people on the road weren't, the, the truck drivers weren't allowed to make contact with their family unless they were stopped at a rest stop. And so this again, increased that isolation and separation from people and their support systems going forward. So these interviews reinforced the extent of what was coming through on the online surveys and also the telephone survey and the factors that were driving mental health were very, very complex and multifactorial. We know that there's no quick fix, otherwise we would have done it before, <laughs> because there's many facets to address. There's the driver, the company, the processes, the regulations, the policies, the public, and the list continues. Drivers and family members found it really difficult to suggest actual solutions. 
and that that they saw could possibly work. And there were some similarities between these suggestions and what they found was working. However, it was it was not an area that they came up with, oh, we need to do this, we need to do that. So we themed the uh, suggestions and the possible solutions that they were coming through with. And this is the list that we came up with from the, um, from the interviews, from the in-depth interviews. So there was an emphasis on the importance of strong connections with people. And as we know, humans have this basic need to be connected. For some, this was a family unit back home. In others, it was a great relationship with their boss or some mates they had on their road at the same time and they would connect on radio conversations, particularly over long, lonely night trips. Those that made time to connect once home again displayed stronger levels of coping and appeared to have higher levels of optimism when talking about their lives and their future. Many talked about the workplace culture and how important it was for managers to treat each driver as important and respect them as a person. They, they also discussed how their need, there needed to be more of a greater emphasis on mental and physical health. For example, don't reward drivers at the depot with donuts if you're looking at promoting health, which some places do. Um, they're also mentioning that some places could also support and model and uh, make it even mandatory potentially, <laughs> um, blood pressure and diabetes checks, as well as the alcohol and drug checks. And I know that some of the people said that every year their company encourages and gets people to have health checks as well. Some companies were identified as doing these things in place and they were applauded by the drivers for changing the workplace culture. They also identified how we all need to decrease the stigmatization of mental health discussions across the industry. One of the, one of the um, statements from the family member, I think the industry needs to provide some space for drivers to be able to say, okay, we actually expect you to look after your health and well-being. We have a duty of care to you and we have to meet that duty of care. Some of the comments and, and actual narrative came, that came from the interviews, this was from a driver. I got myself well with some professional help and a lot of help from my partner. And I've learned to deal with everything that I was exposed to. There were three people that were talking about their very positive experience of seeking help and getting help. One was from a chaplain, one was from a psychologist, and one was from a psychiatrist. And they said that their life was so much richer and better, and they were coping so much, so much more effectively because of the help they sought. Others were talking about the amazing help they got from their partners and the ability for them to support them going forward. But they all came through that it was a multi-pronged approach, that it was industry needs to come to the table and that we have to all be willing with the government and everybody else <laughs> willing to invest some money to be able to look at how we can improve and maintain <laughs> maintain first, improve and support people in their health and well-being going forward. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth. <clears throat> An amazing insight. You know, I can uh, easily understand the outcome as well as suggestions coming through your survey. Um, being you know formally involved in tracking as well as driving. I understand exactly how this survey was done, and I really appreciate your time and effort making uh, things better for truck drivers in the industry. Thank you. Now I would like to welcome uh, Lyndall Danny, appointed woman in Trekking Australia, CEO in 2019. Heavy vehicle driver Lyndall Danny works with a talented board of professionals whose strategic uh, uh, strategic focus reminds on creating employment and training opportunities for women seeking to establish trucking careers in overwhelmingly male-dominated Australian road transport sector. Across an eight-year career, Lindell's driven road trains, it's amazing, throughout Western Australia, South Australia, New South Wales, Victoria, and across the top end. Through wet season, flat waters, 
and fires, transporting everything from oversized mining infrastructure to conflicts. The recipient of Rotary International Paul Harris Fellow for her work in road safety and an ambassador for OzHelp's Health in Gear initiative. These days, Lindell does regional road train work out of Adelaide. Please join me in welcoming Lindell. Thank you so much, Vasan, and thank you too to the staff of the Mental Health Foundation of Australia for giving me the opportunity to outline the unique challenges women face in this overwhelmingly male-dominated um, industry in terms of maintaining their mental health. Um, few people um, out in the community truly understand the critical role that truck drivers play in keeping our economy ticking over. As essential workers, um, always, but particularly in the last couple of years, truckies have worked around the clock to ensure that everyone from healthcare professionals to mums and dads have everything they need to navigate the current pandemic. And quite simply, um, without truck drivers, we really would all be sitting on the ground mm -hmm. naked and starving. And I think a lot of people just don't realise the importance of the work that the drivers do. Truck driving is also the most dangerous vocation in the country. It's one of the loneliest and it's certainly one of the most thankless vocations. Uh, my colleagues spend endless hours alone in their heads, in their trucks, counting the white lines and overthinking is pandemic across the truck driver cohort. Um, and for those suffering mental health issues, we many forget too that medications for them to, to help deal with those mental health issues are very limited because of the very fact that they're behind the wheel of 150 tonne on the highway. So that's another layer of complexity woven into the issues. I remember um, we had our very first... Um, Female Truck Driver Awards at International Women Day in Mar Women's Day in March this year, <laughs> which was just wonderful for the girls to finally be recognised for the, the great work that they're all quiet achievers just doing out there. And one of the, the male truck drivers um, made a comment that the real heroes of the trucking industry are the wives and female partners at home keeping those home fires burning, looking after the children while the boys are out on the road. And that's there's certainly a lot of truth in that, and I, I can only agree with that. But the harsh reality for female truckies is that they fill both roles, uh, driving and keeping the home fires burning. So we don't have wives or, you know, we, we are the wives. We, so we're still doing that work at home and we're, we're out there working in our trucks. And given women are still the primary carers, um, this whole other level of complexity is woven into the challenges we girls face. The majority of um, female heavy vehicle drivers who are mums to school-aged children, uh, according to our research, are single mothers. Um, so that's, um, again, um, a situation where we've had uh, homeschooling is a new thing. And so these mums are driving their trucks and homeschooling their children now. So some of those women, if they're owner drivers, they are taking the children in the trucks with them. That may be a bit difficult when they're going on to ma major work sites and, you know, who's allowed in the truck and who's not. But we're women, we work these things out. So they're doing homeschooling in the truck as they're, they're driving along. Others, when they pull up for their breaks, will do a couple of hours of homeschooling with their children. The nans and pops are in there helping out. Some of the school work's a little bit beyond them these days, particularly because a lot of it's Zoom meetings and so forth. So these mums, are driving trucks and bring up the children and looking after elderly parents. So um, 
lot of lot of things happening there for the girls um, driving heavy vehicles. Uh, gender bias, sexism, misogyny are rife in this overwhelmingly male-dominated sector, and they're all issues that the boys don't need to deal with. Um, I know that uh, female truckies mm -hmm. over a period of time learn to develop resilience that, that other women perhaps don't have because to survive, we need to be able to, to get those resilience levels up. So WITA, or Women in Trucking Australia, has been set up for female heavy vehicle drivers by female heavy vehicle drivers. So our board consists of four road train drivers. Um, and, and so the board itself understands, and of course I'm out there on the roads Monday to Thursday. Um, I am a company driver with Cube. So we understand the complexities and the needs of these women. Um, and, and, and so we're helping these women to cope with things that up until recently they've had to deal with alone. They've been just been wandering out there in, in a wasteland. Um, women in Trucking Australia has a strong heartbeat and our, our truck drivers, whether we're male or female, are an incredibly close-knit group of people and we encourage each other. If you, if you pull up a at a truck stop and you see a truck you sitting by him or herself um, eating because we spend so much time alone, take the time to walk up to the table and say hi and be prepared to take that time to listen. Um, you know, yes, we have deadlines for freight, but, you know, the human factor is so much more important and making sure that your colleagues are okay. Um, we need, I'm, I'm, so, um, I'm so heartened to hear of the work being done by the Mental Health Foundation of Australia and Dr Pritchard and her incredible team um, because that culture of, of, of taking a tablespoon of cement and hardening up needs to be addressed and abolished. Um, it, it's, you know, belongs somewhere back on a park bench in the 1930s. Um, I'm in, hugely encouraged to hear of the great work being done around heavy vehicle driver mental health uh, issues. And it again, extend my sincere thanks to the staff of the Mental Health Foundation for giving me the opportunity to just briefly highlight some of the issues that we face. Um, and shining a light on the challenges faced by my colleagues. There's a lot of great work being done out there to ensure drivers have immediate user-friendly access to mental health advice and counselling. And of course, the more we discuss mental health in forums such as this and familiarise ourselves with the work being done by Dr Pritchard and her team, the more we can take the sting out of its tail, which in turn will allow people um, to feel safe enough to reach out. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, uh, Alinda. It's an amazing insight. Uh, let, me, let me share one thing. What you said, absolutely right. Uh, the wives and partners keeps us uh, really strong um, and focused. Uh, I, let, let me share this. It'll be very interesting for you both to hear and, and uh, our listeners. When my um, wife, uh, Lata, was carrying our first child. Uh, it was uh, almost one week before our, our daughter was born. So I had a full truckload of um, uh, pizza boxes uh, leaving um, Melbourne and going through uh, Castle Mine, Bendigo, Shepparton, Irova, Alexandria, coming down to Lilydale, 4.30 in the morning. The police stopped me near Lilydale. I said, what the heck are you doing with an, uh, a pregnant lady in the, in the truck? I said, all right, this is our family. You know, we, we, we are talking everything on the road and we are together on the road. When we go home, we are together. So within a week, the, the child was born. So I'm saying that this is something which, and I totally agree, that without the mothers and the wife and the partners, uh, it is very difficult to handle while you are on the road. Thank you. Thank you for sharing everything with us. Thank you. Now, I would like to invite um, uh, you all to uh, view a special address from Mr. Bruce Wong, Managing Director of Food Solution Group, Australia and America, a sponsor of Mental Health Foundation Australia. Through his financial contribution, the MHFA has been made able to deliver 85,000 meals during COVID-19 
to those who need in it the most, many of whom are truck drivers as well. Please join me being Bruce Wong's address. Mm -hmm. To help Foundation Australia is an organization committed to improving the mental well-being of all Australians. <clears throat> Good Solutions vision and value are very aligned with Mental Health Foundation Australia and we have been supporting this charitable organization for over two years now through various programs. We have been very involved in the meal delivery initiative organized by the foundation, which was a huge success last year and has continued this year with over 85,000 meals delivered so far. Food Solution is honored to be involved in the National Mental Health Month Awareness Campaign run by the foundation which brings the Australian community together to raise awareness, stand the stigma and initiate conversation about better mental health and importance of mental well-being which is required now more than ever. And one thing we can thank the pandemic for is bringing mental health to the forefront, creating the opportunity for more open discussion to be had, furthering the breaking down of stigma and the opportunity to really look at what is required in the mental health space. Another thing we can thank the pandemic for is platform like Zoom, which help bring us all together in such a wonderful way. This year, the foundation is launching for the first time the Mental Health Appeal on the 10th of October to raise funds to develop a program to educate the community in a hope to prevent youth suicide. I commend the important work Mental Health Foundation Australia is doing in the Australian community, especially within the multicultural cohort. My best wishes and appreciation to Hassan and Jim for providing excellent leadership and direction to this organization. Good Solution will continue to be involved with the Mental Health Foundation Australia and its initiative in improving the mental health of all Australians. I encourage you all to interact with more events during National Mental Health Month, which you can find out more about their website. www.nhfa.org.au. And thank you and enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Bruce, um, uh, for his ongoing support for the foundation. Uh, can you hear me all? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. And Bruce um, himself, and he, he's well connected with the trucking industry, and he's a big supporter of the Mental Health Foundation. And when we started uh, the meal delivery uh, during uh, lockdown two and three, uh, I had a coffee with him just a week before. He said, what's, what's on for the Mental Health Foundation? I said, we're coming uh, with a program to deliver meals to the needy people throughout Victoria. And I'm just thinking of hiring a small refrigerator truck to deliver the meals, uh, along with Salvation Army and my center and other organization connected to us. He said, what do you want? I said, looking for a refrigerated van or a truck. He will not believe um, Dr. Elizabeth and Lindell. Three days later, he called me, Vasan, I bought a, a nice refrigerated vehicle mm -hmm. for Mental Health Foundation. 
It's the one collected from Oakley uh, Center. So we, we have amazing support coming through the community. And that 85,000 meals were prepared by the community at the kitchen, always three kitchens running in a day, wow. almost 2,000, 3,000 meals a day we prepare. And the groceries and everything donated by each and every Australian we come across. We did not spend a cent to buy groceries. And it came from the community, prepared by the community and delivered by the community for the benefit of the community. So this man mm. has really made us a stronger in our uh, reach out to the community during lockdowns. That's awesome. Uh, we will now have a panel discussion with our speakers uh, this morning. Uh, feel free. Uh, if any question could come across as a chat line, it will be good. I <laughs> I've already received some questions. I'm going to put it to both of you one by one. Uh, the first one is, we know that this industry is dominated by males. Why is there are not many females taking up this work? First to you, Dr. Pritchard. Yes, well, it's difficult to speculate on, on why in relation to that's not my experience. So I cannot, don't think that I'm qualified to actually expect, um, to speak on that particularly, except to say that, that the um, people that I interviewed, and there was one that was female, she actually had quite a different experience to what you described, Linda, and, and she said that she's never had any gender issues, she's never been treated differently than one of the boys, so to speak, and I do that in quotation marks for a reason. Um, she hadn't experienced sexism or anything that was negative to her from her work colleagues, um, which was refreshing to hear as, as well. So I think it's, it's, it's good to recognise that there's never one size fits all. There may be different levels of a continuum that people are experiencing. And I think we need to do that with any of our um, um, programs or interventions going forward. So yeah. I'm going to hand over to Lyndall because I'm sure she'll have more insights into this <laughs> reason. <laughs> I could talk for days. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Pritchard. Um, I, I guess I probably should point out the fact that whilst we have issues with gender bias and, and sexism in the industry, the our male colleagues are overwhelmingly supportive of the work that we girls do, always happy to, to um, share their knowledge and their experience with us. So that's an important thing to, uh, to note there. Um, gender diversity in the industry is supported in the truck yards. It is supported at corporate level. Unfortunately, uh, from our research and experience, by the time those policies and procedures trickle down to recruitment level, there seems to be a shingle on the front door that says men only are welcome. Mm -hmm. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of women out there with heavy vehicle driver's licences uh, and who are, find themselves continually overlooked. And just a quick story about one of our girls, Samantha, um, when she was a relatively new truck driver, but she had some experience putting um, resumes out to industry um, and nothing was coming back to, you know, job after job after job, nothing. So she, she sat down and she looked at her resume and she updated it and inadvertently put Sam on there instead of Samantha mm -hmm. and guess what happened? Mm -hmm. It was just incredible the numbers of invitations in for interview that were coming through her email. Again, then when she was sitting in front of the interviewers, just the comment, oh, well, we thought you were a bloke. Um, others often aren't so um, open with those types of comments, but it is out there, whether it's, it's unconscious bias or gender bias does exist. And, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that area as well. That's, that's, that's interesting um, uh, insight. The next question to Dr. Pritchard. Um, what was the rationale behind conducting your study and what led to it? Mm. I think I mentioned this in my sort of opening address as well, is that 
um, we were, it was sort of based on the findings from a previous study where there um, was identification that there was a lot of workers claim, compensation claims that were not about accidents as we sort of thought that they may have been. And so it was to investigate more about well, what are the actual factors that are involved in here and and how can we get more understanding of what that is across Australian drivers so that we can then help support the intervention going forward. And we didn't just leave our study at, at exploring that information and leaving it there. The next, um, the next nine months is about uh, trialling a, um, a programme intervention of um, resources for supervisors, allocators and line managers to help support them to recognise the factors that they could have influence over. Because it's not just about the driver. We can't keep just targeting the driver because there's so many multi, multifactorial things that, that play into mental health. And so we're looking at, at complementing what's already out there for the last 12, 18 months around um, supporting mental health in drivers to look at how can we increase the awareness and understanding of, of those at the next level who are the dispatchers and the line managers and allocators of drivers as well. Thank you. Uh, the next question I received, how might a friend or a family member approach a truck driver whose behavior has changed? Start with Linda. Sorry, who's sorry, Sam? Who's what has changed? Uh, whose behaviour has changed? Oh, look, I think um, listening is a great way to start. Um, men are renowned for not opening up, as well as females. They they're not as they don't communicate as well as we we women do. And I think um, some gentle questions around. Um, trying to prompt, you know, an an answers around what's bothering the driver. Um, being available always um, by phone um, to, to talk to your partner, um, having the children there as well. I guess trying to create a family unit as much as you can when you've got your truck driver, you know, away for such extended periods of time means that if they can be a part of that, even though they're not there, then this overthinking, that's the thing that really leads to a lot of this mental health distress that we see in, in truck drivers. Communicating, being in touch is just critical. Thank you. Uh, follow up from that, um, uh, what can we do when they don't want to get help for their mental health? are in denial yes well this is an interesting question and i think in relation to linking to the other one how do you approach a truck driver um, whose behavior has changed i think it's gently and compassionately <laughs> just like we would approach anybody um, because no one know no one likes to be told that we have a problem and no one likes to be told there's a weakness there or a whatever there because no matter how we change the stigma of recognizing that we need to ask for support is a strength, not a weakness. Mm. People still interpret things their own way. And so I think it's really important to do that. And, and within that sort of compassionate, gentle approach, um, my background is, is um, also in positive psychology. It's like, I don't, I don't believe that I can judge literally, quote unquote, somebody, whether they, they have a problem or not, I can I can describe my experience of like oh mate you're getting a bit you, you're getting really titchy here or I, I see that you're getting really irritable or you're getting more angry and la 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 and yeah what's going on and so it's that thing like Linda was saying listening listening and being there and letting them know that somebody has noticed because we all have as I mentioned before we all have that need for that human need for connection. And so what is that human need for connection? We all have a need to know that somebody cares. And if we approach something with, with um, a, a certain person and we're still concerned about them, I think we, we need to act on that concern. We need to talk to somebody else. If they've got a brother or a sister or a partner or a, or a workmate that they're close to or a colleague in the, in the organisation that you can have a chat to 
it's like without breaching confidentiality of course but it's like if you are concerned we need to do something about it don't ignore it don't pretend it's not there if you're concerned and have that little uh, inside you and like oh this is not quite right be brave be courageous and and say something so the person knows they're not on their own thank you doctor could I just could i just interject there i'm sorry yeah. dr pritchard are you aware of any work being done in this particular area because i'm not um to help families to be able to help the drivers with that gentleness and compassion that you speak of because that is just critical. Mm. Is there anything being done to help um, the families, to help the drivers? At this stage, I'm not aware of that either. I know oh that, that the family members, like like we interviewed family members and that hasn't been done before. It was just like, let's focus yeah. on the driver, the driver. And yes. so getting that whole um, sort of gambit of what it's like for the for the family member and, and constantly they were like, some of them said, I feel like the psychologist, he rants at me, he raves at me and not not in an abusive way, but he, he lets off steam because there's no one else to let off steam yeah. and it's up to me to help him get through that. And so one of the people that I did interview did, was actually doing a psychology degree. <laughs> and she says, so I've got the goods to help him. <laughs> but she said, I don't think other family members do. And so yeah, it, it, was, it was awesome to hear that side of the story as well. And it, it's definitely a huge need, Linda, definitely a huge need to help support these people. Um, the ones that were approaching um, pay professionals um, or health professionals to get actual professional um, mental health support, some of them were, had received an ultimatum from their partners going, you will do this or we're, we're over. Um, and yeah. so some of them were at that level. Um, yeah. But it's, it, I mean, partners are partners. You have the skills that you have the skills um, for your partnership. And it's like, we should not be expecting them to take the brunt or be the magic pill or whatever. Mm. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a difficult area. It is. Um, mm. uh, the next question I have, what are the most prominent um, psychosocial hazards for truck drivers? What are the most prominent Psycho oh, hazards. psychosocial hazards? Hazards. I think what Lyndall's mentioned, the isolation. The mm. isolation, the rumination. Um, I've got some beautiful quotes in some of the interviews that the people just go, you've just got so much time to think. I just think, think, think in my own thoughts all the time. Mm. And some of them like that because they found that really supportive and they fed their, fed their minds with, with um, audio books and things like that on the road. They were more optimistic. They were more connected with, with family and friends. However, mm. most of them said it's just the thoughts. You're alone with your thoughts. So any, any problem by the end of that 12, 14, 16 hours that you've been out there, is like it's huge because you've been there alone thinking about it. Mm. I think I think too the pressures, the constant pressures that are, are placed on drivers um, in terms of ensuring that that they're up there with their compliance in terms of safety mm. and and different state and territory legislation and delivery demands and you know you're held up because of road works so suddenly you're behind the eight ball mm -hmm. you know that something's happening at home and you can't be there so it, it it's a constant constant pressure and I you know the old saying never ever die for somebody's freight is so so important mm -hmm. if you are feeling pressured and you are tired we impress upon our our women take a break take a breather um you know mm -hmm. go for a walk around your truck have have a sleep if you, if you need to do that so that that pressure uh, mm. decreases and you know as Dr Pritchard mentioned keeping in touch and communicating with families and so forth I think um, communication is not good in the road transport sector either mm. um, you work it out by the time you get there is the catchphrase we hear often and we need to be able to say no no we're not going to work it out by the time we get there. We need you to provide this, this, this and this. And I think chain of responsibility legislation has done a lot um, to, to lessen the, the stress that drivers feel while they're out on the road as well. Mm, thank you. 
Um, another question here uh, for both. Uh, what are your top three recommendations to decision makers to address the mental health crisis of truck drivers? Top three. Mm, there's so many. <laughs> the top three. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think creating the culture in the industry that it's okay to talk about mental health without the fear of being sacked, sacked, without the fear of being looked over, without the fear of ramifications, without the fear of being told you're weak. All of that stuff is just total ridiculousness that, that we need to fight against. And we need to find ways to support that. And that's a huge thing. I mean, that, that's, we're still struggling with that in our society, let alone in an industry. And I think that's one of the things. One is that we need support services that are beginning to emerge to have the, the support that they need, the financial support, the skill support, so that they can continue to carry out their amazing work that they do. There's, there's organisations that are beginning to be really focused on supporting the mental health and physical health of truck drivers, and yet they're still really underfunded. And so we need to support that. And we also need to support the efficacy of that. It's like, how, how effective are they? Many programs over the last two or three decades have happened. And some of them, the drivers reported were really useful. However, they haven't been, they haven't been researched. They haven't been shown that they're useful. And so they've just fallen by the wayside. So I think we need to have that connection as well. And we need to just totally, absolutely be, be 100% about this is a multi-pronged approach it is not the problem of the driver it is a multi-pronged approach and we need a multi-pronged solution Anything I from think you, uh, from my perspective at grassroots level that organize management in organizations need to view truck drivers as more than just a commodity um, a, a cohort that that take the trucks and deliver the freight. We are people with families. We do have mental health issues. Um, it's, it's great to, to organise um, or to develop a culture of cohesiveness and support within the organisation, staff barbecues, taking the time to, to thank the drivers, to make sure that they are okay, not just paying lip service to things like that is, is very, very important as well, I think. Thank you. Uh, before I say thank you to both uh, both of you, but let me share a journey. Uh, in I think it was somewhere around 1991, I was driving to Adelaide, a um, 14 ton truck full of uh, pizza boxes. I had a young boy from um, Monash, sorry, Melbourne University working with me uh, during his holidays. So we reach at the place called Nail. Um, it's morning 3.30. And both of my friend uh, wheel busted at the same time. <laughs> you, can, you can imagine my mental health status at the time. I was just dragging along the road and just stops. And it was almost 30, 35 minutes. We were just waiting to see someone will stop. Suddenly the huge, uh, you know, uh, I can say road train passed me and it reversed back. And husband and wife jumped out of the truck. I said, God, send them to me. Four o'clock in the morning, both of them were truckies. Got done, helped me to remove both the tires and replace with the one from the back. I said, don't go, wait until 5.30, 6 o'clock, drive to Adelaide early in the morning, change your tires. Uh, they were kind, so supportive on the road. And uh, to me, you know, I've seen that in, in India, Singapore, as well as Australia. Uh, Australian drivers are more courteous and supportive on the road. Truck drivers are a, a, a close-knit group of people and we do look out for our own. Uh, as, as you saw, you know, just reversing a road train to, to pull up and help you so... Yeah, we, we also encourage our drivers if we see a truck pulled up on the side of the road and perhaps when we're on our way back, it's still there. Just do a, a, a bit of a, a check-in to see that that driver's okay. Very, very important. Absolutely. And that, that's a lovely story. It mm -hmm. is. And, and not only that, when he got out of the truck, jumped over, hey, move away. You, you, you are much smaller than the tyre. Let me handle it for you. 
to to conclude this thank you to our panel um, dr prichard and uh, lindel uh, amazing insightful discussion uh, this you. morning and taken uh, as a token of appreciation we will post you our um, gift to you very soon and before thank we <laughs> thank you so much for your time it's really appreciated to to learn and understand what you both are doing in your own industry Thank and you. it's it's an amazing and can i just like... give a can i just yeah. give a tiny little plug sure. for um all the resources if you want any more of the resources they're all on our um website drivinghealth.net and so the resources are there and also the program the intervention program that i talked about for supervisors allocators and line managers is in there as well called the dhat program driving health allocator training program Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we would like to play a short video on our walk, which is our national mental health walk awareness campaign tomorrow morning, 10.30. We are actually reaching out to each and every Australian through our network and each and every state and territories of Australia. Uh, please join me in viewing this. Australia, are you ready for a challenge? And that too for a good cause? Then look no further. Join the Emma Chaffee as we walk for mental health across the country on the 17th of October at 10.30am in each state and territory capital. Worried about COVID? Well, we've got you covered. We have launched our Emma Chaffee app where you can walk virtually raising funds as an individual or in a team. Visit our website for more information about getting started. So come on, Australia. Our journey to better mental health starts with one step. Thank you. We we established this National Mental Health uh, Walk um, on 2018, 19, 20. Started from 700 last year. Virtually, we had 140,000 people joined us wow. nationwide. So hopefully tomorrow we expect much more than that. Wow, and now brilliant. I would like to thank our speakers for participating and sharing uh, their insights uh, on this important topic today. Mm -hmm. I would also like to thank our attendees and uh, participating on this Saturday morning. And I sincerely thank our staff, uh, Nitya, Akshay, for their contribution and support. Uh, for both of you, uh, we, we have 14 staff uh, running this National Mental Health Awareness Campaign. Uh, we have more than 70 events throughout the month, including the good uh, appeal, what we did like a Good Friday appeal or uh, Red Shield appeal on the 10th of October. We raised money, uh, as I said earlier, to prepare a course for su suicide prevention. And also we are establishing a first ever um, hub in Victoria, uh, what you have seen um, in the reports uh, previously. Um, no, we, we, are, we are planning to establish a first ever uh, hub in Victoria, which is outcome based. So anyone who walks through it, uh, that we make sure that their problems are solved at the end of the session with a psychologist. And thank you and have a nice day. Thank you.